On the fifth anniversary of our marriage, I promised Vanessa a grand wedding. I regretted not giving her a proper wedding when we first got married, but on the wedding day, she received a message and rushed off in a hurry. As I chased after her, she patted me on the shoulder and comforted me. Noah, there's an important issue at the company. I have to go. Her lie was clumsy, but I no longer wanted to expose her, because I had cancer and didn't have much time left. Chapter 1 Vanessa didn't know that I had received the message before her. The WeChat notification chimed, and when I opened it, I saw the words, Noah, I won't interfere in your life anymore. Are you satisfied? Before I could react, I saw Vanessa glance at her phone, and then she hurried out. Her expression flustered. She was always so composed and controlled. It was the first time I'd seen her like this. When I stood up to follow her, I bumped into the doorframe, and my knee throbbed with pain. She didn't even look back, closing the car door and leaving me with only her parting words. For this wedding, I had refused chemotherapy. I had hoped to make up for not giving Vanessa a wedding in my final days. But in the end, this was how it turned out. For a brief moment, I wanted to flee from here. But looking at the eyes around me, I realized we weren't newlyweds going through the motions of a wedding. After years of marriage, we had carefully considered and invited only close friends and family, just six tables, a small gathering of people dear to us. Among them were my roommates from school and friends from work, all who had traveled from far away to fulfill my sentimental wish. I awkwardly turned back to greet each of them. Finally, after seating everyone, I slumped into a chair, too exhausted to speak. Then, my mom called, yelling, Do you even care? Your brother is dying and you still have the heart to throw a wedding. I didn't even have the strength to stand. I calmly listened as she vented. It took me a moment to understand that Oscar, battling depression, had slit his wrists on the school rooftop. I barely found my voice and said, the bride already went to save him, didn't she? What more do you want me to do? Should I die for him too? To ease your anger, will that cure his illness? There was one more thing I didn't say. I won't live much longer. Soon, you'll all be satisfied but I didn't want them to know. I didn't want to see any of them in my final days. What are you saying? Even your wife couldn't stand it. Your brother, who grew up with you, is dying, and you don't care at all. How can you be so heartless? Mom continued to scold me, not knowing that just speaking those words had set my throat ablaze with pain. I suppressed a cough and hung up the phone. When it came to Oscar, I always lost. He could effortlessly take everything from me. Oscar was my uncle's son. After my uncle and aunt died in a car accident, we took him in. From then on, I heard this sentence almost daily, Oscar has suffered enough, why do you still fight with him, can't you let him have his way? Chapter 2, that night, Vanessa came home, exhausted, I was tending to my knee injury, though I didn't really care to deal with it, but it seemed to be serious, and even a minor infection caused me immense pain these days, she sat down beside me slowly and said, Noah, I'm sorry, today was really an accident, please don't be mad at me, okay, her gaze seemed so sincere, if not for the truth in front of me. I might have been fooled by those eyes again. Vanessa, let's get a divorce. I'm too tired. I didn't want to look at her anymore and continued treating my wound. As soon as I finished wrapping the gauze, she suddenly lunged forward and hugged me tightly. Maybe it was the guilt from doing something wrong, but she seemed flustered and even bumped into my injury. I hissed in pain, and she slowly let go, kneeling in front of me, sincerely saying, Noah, we'll have many more anniversaries. Please don't say divorce so casually, it's hurtful. Vanessa, Today was the last bit of dignity I could give you. I met her eyes directly as I spoke. She froze for a moment. Then her expression became panicked. Noah, it's not what you think. Really, the situation was just too urgent, and I had to go. But I didn't dare tell you because I was afraid you'd misunderstand. I, for the first time, Vanessa stammered. Vanessa, what are you afraid of? Am I that terrifying? Or are you all afraid that I'll bully Oscar? And now you're afraid I'll bully you too. I chuckled bitterly. Noah. You're too emotional right now. I don't want to argue. She avoided the topic and retreated to the bathroom for a shower. I ignored her and went to the study. As I closed the door, I realized my hands were trembling. I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling. I found it hard to sleep, only getting three or four hours of rest each night. In truth, I should have woken up long ago. Oscar was the son that Vanessa held close to her heart. When I met Vanessa, she had already broken up with Oscar. She never showed me a photo of her ex-boyfriend and I only knew that the relationship had deeply hurt her, but I had no idea that her ex was Oscar. We both tacitly avoided mentioning it, until we got married, and one year, during the New Year's holiday, Oscar came home too, that day, Oscar was there, and for the first time, I saw Vanessa lose her composure, which made me deeply uneasy. I wanted to ask Vanessa, but every time I brought it up, she would brush it off, saying it was in the past and not worth discussing, as it would only bring discomfort. After the New Year, Oscar went abroad to study violin, his passion, 
My parents sold their house to support him and moved back to the countryside. I couldn't explain how I felt at that time, growing up. It had always been like this, Oscar could pursue expensive music lessons, while I couldn't even afford tutoring fees. I'll never forget my mom's proud expression when she learned Oscar was continuing his studies. She said she never imagined our family would produce a musician. Vanessa was beside me then, holding my hand tightly, saying, in my eyes, my husband is the best. I gave her everything. My phone was always open for her to see, and I handed over my bank card for her to manage. She had a sensitive stomach, so I learned to cook, preparing meals for her every day after work. At night, we would walk hand in hand. Life was simple and pure and I thought it would always be that way. Then Oscar returned, not as a famous musician, but with severe depression. His arms were covered in scars from self-inflicted cuts, and my mom cried as she held him. He came to me, looking haggard, and said, Noah, I regret it. Can you give Vanessa back to me? I found the whole situation absurd. He was used to getting his way with just a word, expecting me to always back down. I ignored him, treating him like a madman. He had been with Vanessa once. He was the one who told me so. I still remember that New Year's Eve, with fireworks lighting up the sky. He said he wanted to watch the fireworks with me, pulling me outside. Vanessa stayed inside, playing cards with the elders. He kept pulling me along as we walked. Chapter 3 We walked a long way, until we reached a bench in a park where he pulled me down to sit. He began talking to himself about the past, sighing, Noah, it's hard to believe that such a small boy back then is now married. I was at a loss for words, unsure of what to say. Then, suddenly, he changed his tone, Noah, you've always hated me, haven't you? Say something. I really didn't know how to respond. You hated me so much that you married Vanessa just because she used to be my girlfriend. In an instant, I felt a chill run through my body. He was Vanessa's ex-boyfriend, and we had been married for less than a month. I swear, if I had known they had been together, I would have stayed as far away as possible, but I didn't know. Vanessa came into my life, telling me how much she liked me, standing by my side during my toughest times. I didn't know you two were together. I finally explained. He gave me a look but said nothing, walking ahead on his own. A few days later, he left to pursue his musical dreams. Before leaving, he sent me a message, you've given way to me so many times, this time I'll let you have her. I read that message and had a huge fight with Vanessa. What did he mean by letting me have her? If Vanessa still had feelings for him, they could stay together, and I would accept that I had misjudged her. Vanessa cried out that it was an undeserved disaster, showing me her phone, Noah. You can't treat me like this. I didn't know about your relationship with him. What would you have done if you had known about us? I would have gotten together with you sooner, avoided him at all costs, and never looked back, she said, closing her eyes as she spoke. She made me laugh. Then she pounced into my arms, playfully kissing my cheek. For the next few years, Oscar indeed didn't appear in our lives, and I almost forgot about the whole situation, until he returned, worn out and defeated after finishing his studies. At that time, Oscar constantly complained about feeling cold, which could also be because he came back in winter. My mom had gained so much gray hair from worrying, and I even introduced him to a few doctors I knew, until one day, I saw the way Vanessa looked at him. I couldn't lie to myself anymore. How could anyone hide that kind of affection? It was like a steel needle piercing my heart, making it hard to breathe. I confronted her, and for the first time, she got angry, enough, Noah, he's in such bad shape, and you're still making a fuss. That was the first time I avoided the situation. I left her and went home alone. I tried not to think about it for a while. The many years of love and companionship allowed me to deceive myself, to keep dreaming. Later, she went on a business trip to Tibet, returning just in time for New Year's. We went together to my parents' house to bring gifts. Without me knowing, I saw her pull out a bag of saffron and hand it to Oscar, saying, the locals told me that this will warm you up. Then, under Oscar's surprised and grateful gaze, she pulled out a safety talisman and said, they also say this will keep you safe and sound. I remained silent the entire time, feeling dazed, as if I had gone back years in time, when my parents would return from trips with loads of gifts for Oscar while I could only watch, like a dog wagging its tail in hope. On the way home, Vanessa tried to hold my hand, but I kept pulling away. Then, suddenly, I realized she had slipped a silver ring onto my ring finger without me noticing. I was surprised. She squeezed my cheek and said, Is my Noah turning into a jealous husband? The saffron was something mom asked me to buy, and the talisman was just something I picked up on the way. They say your brother might have been cursed, but the ring is something I chose carefully, with me around. You'll always be safe. She had a way with words when speaking sweetly. I suddenly kissed her on the forehead and said, Vanessa, let's have a proper wedding. I've always felt bad about not giving you one. We locked eyes, and in that moment, I truly believed that all my suspicions were just in my head. She loved me, in that moment, I really, 
really wanted to tell her. While she was on her business trip, my insomnia had gotten worse, and I often vomited. I went to the hospital for a checkup, and when I got the diagnosis, I couldn't believe it. How could it be? I was still so young. How could I be leaving this world already? I went to several different hospitals, but the results were the same. I pulled out my phone, wanting to tell her, but I couldn't calm down. I couldn't even face myself. I didn't know who to talk to or how to say it. The doctor asked me why I hadn't come sooner. I told them it was like this during university. Whenever I got anxious, I would vomit. During my university days, my mom had no money left to support me because she was paying for Oscar's expensive music education. She had only paid my tuition. Every day, she would message or call me, telling me to work hard, reminding me of our family's financial situation. Sometimes, I would receive messages from her as early as 6 or 7 in the morning, asking if I had found a part-time job, if I was making money, or if I was eligible for a scholarship. She said she was anxious because the family could never save money. She wondered how she would be able to retire in the future. I asked her why she was still paying for Oscar's expensive music education, and she angrily scolded me, why are you always so petty? Always hung up on Oscar, he finally has a dream, shouldn't I support him? And what about me? What more do you want? I've already paid for your college. Are you trying to drive me to my grave? She wanted Oscar to live the life she had envisioned for him, at the cost of my own survival, but she didn't see it as a problem. She would only say, I gave birth to you, I raised you, what more do you want? Every day, I worried about my living expenses, how to make money, how to improve my resume, and how to find better paying jobs. It was during that time that I met Vanessa. She comforted me, understood me. Later, she accompanied me through the challenges of starting a business traveling everywhere to save money. We bought standing tickets for train rides that lasted more than 20 hours. She bought two small stools, and we sat together, holding each other. She always said, we'll live a good life one day, but now, I don't have many days left to live. Chapter 4 Vanessa didn't know that on the night of the wedding, as we were walking home, I passed by a jewelry store, and the name felt strangely familiar. I entered the store on impulse, taking the silver ring off my ring finger to ask the salesgirl about it. She was a young girl and her face turned a bit red as she explained. This ring. Last Sunday evening, we were about to close when a woman rushed in straight from the airport to buy it for her husband. She must love her husband very much, or else why would she be in such a hurry? In such a hurry, perhaps because she did something wrong, I muttered softly, not knowing who I was talking to. She awkwardly froze. I turned and left the store. I wondered why she suddenly bought the ring. When we were almost home, she had bought gifts for everyone, except me. Maybe it was out of guilt and she bought an expensive ring to make up for it. All those feelings of gratitude I had seemed so ridiculous now. Those nights. Countless times I wanted to tell her. To tell her about my illness. To seek out a bit of warmth that never existed. Just my own wishful thinking. I lay in bed. Staring blankly at the ceiling. Suddenly. The door opened. And Vanessa kissed me on the lips. Saying. Noah. What will it take for you to stop overthinking? A wave of nausea surged up my throat. I pushed her away violently. Rushing to the bathroom and vomiting uncontrollably, she looked humiliated, Noah, what are you doing? How can you treat me like this? I ignored her, slumping to the floor, after finally gathering the strength to stand, I splashed cold water on my face and said, let's get a divorce, I'm serious, she threw a handkerchief at me and turned around, saying, you're dreaming, I watched her storm off, I whispered, you will, chapter 5, I went to the hospital for a painkiller injection, I couldn't even swallow painkillers anymore, then, I went straight to Oscar's hospital and just sat there. He became so agitated that he ripped out his four, blood spilling everywhere, as he yelled at me, Noah, what are you doing? Can't you leave me alone? I didn't speak, I just quietly peeled an orange. After finishing, I realized I couldn't even eat it. I was already on a liquid diet. There were so many things I wanted to taste, but I couldn't even manage that. I raised my hand and handed the orange to him, saying, want an orange, it should be sweet. I really wanted to taste it, even if it was sour. Oscar became even more emotional, knocking the orange out of my hand, crying uncontrollably. My mom rushed in, carrying the meal she had prepared for Oscar. I recognized the food but didn't have time to think about it. She raised her hand and slapped me hard across the face, saying, What has Oscar ever done to you? Why can't you leave him alone? The slap made my nose bleed. I looked at the blood on the floor without saying anything and left the room. My mom chased after me, wanting to say something. Finally, she grabbed my arm and said, Noah. What's wrong with you? Are you stressed? Why have you lost so much weight lately? What does it matter to you? I'm your mother. She snapped. Really? I don't believe it. I smiled at her, and as I smiled, tears started falling. I didn't want to talk to her and ran away like I was escaping. But as long as Vanessa didn't sign the divorce papers, 
I would have to keep coming here. We would all keep torturing each other. Chapter 6. Vanessa rushed back home. And I was staring at the porridge I had been boiling to a mush. I tried to swallow a few bites. But I just threw it up. I drank some sugar water. Trying my best to keep it down. Noah. What are you doing? She asked softly. Trying to keep her emotions in check. Can you make me some noodles? Vanessa was a great cook. And her noodles were especially delicious. But it had been a long time since she last cooked. I couldn't remember if it was because of her busy work or some other reason. I had been on a liquid diet for days. Using a straw to sip my meals. Somehow. I just craved her noodles. I had tried many restaurants but couldn't find noodles like the ones she made. But I knew I wouldn't be able to swallow them. Just smelling them would be enough. He's already in that condition. Please stop going to see him. Okay. She pleaded. Her words stabbed into my heart like a knife. Leaving me bleeding inside. Divorce me. And I'll stop seeing him. I stubbornly replied. You're impossible. She yelled. Storming out and slamming the door behind her. Vanessa once said she would never regret marrying me. But I regretted it now. I didn't even understand why I wanted a divorce so badly. I didn't have many days left anyway. But every time I thought about the past, I felt miserable. Do people really change? How did it happen so suddenly? How could she treat me like this? How could she? Why did I offer my heart? Only to have it trampled on. Everyone liked to step on me. Now I just wanted to get away. But even that was impossible. I kept going to see Oscar every day. Anyone who didn't know better would think we were deeply bonded brothers. And then I finally realized who had made those meals. Oscar gave me a challenging look and said, Want to eat? Vanessa made it. Now I can only eat her food. For the first time, I nearly lost my composure there. Before I even left the hospital, Vanessa called me, sounding irritated. Noah, stop making a scene. Okay, Oscar is sick. Divorce me, and I'll stop. I repeated the same words. At the street corner, I thought about getting hit by a car, but then I realized it wouldn't be fair to others. Life was hard enough for everyone. I couldn't use my death to trouble them further. I stepped back, watching the crowd and traffic flow by. All I could think about was how Vanessa was cooking for Oscar, while I couldn't even get her to make me a bowl of noodles. Maybe the heavens heard my plea, or perhaps Oscar couldn't hold on anymore. That day, I went to see Oscar as usual. We argued at the stairway. I envied how he could breathe easily while cursing, full of energy. My mom had called Vanessa over too. Oscar was crying hysterically. I really don't want to see you. Just die. I turned to Vanessa, silently making my intentions clear. Oscar became more and more emotional, pulling at me so violently that I almost fell. Then I saw Vanessa rush over in a panic to steady him. I fell down the stairs, where there were a few pieces of glass at the landing. I raised my hand to block, and bang, the glass shattered. My arm, covered in a white sweater was filled with glass shards. My face had some cuts too. I must have looked pitiful. Vanessa rushed down in a panic, asking, Are you okay? How did this happen? Blood soaked my sweater. Vanessa tried to help me up, but I pushed her away and said, Divorce me. Okay, if we get divorced, I won't come anymore. I promise I won't bother you anymore. Divorce me. Okay. Chapter 7. I really don't have much time left. I can't afford to waste it, and I can't wait any longer. I don't want to see Oscar anymore. I especially don't want to see my mom acting like a mother hen protecting her chick. I don't want them to take care of everything after I die. Because what if there's really an afterlife? And I meet them again. Vanessa's face was dark as she said. Have I really made you hate me this much? Enough that you would do something like this just to divorce me? Fine. As you wish. That day was the lightest I had felt in a long time. After a simple bandage at the hospital. We went to sign the papers. But we still had to wait a month. I felt awful and desperately pleaded with the clerk at the civil affairs office. We both agree to it. Can't we do it now? The clerk responded. You've made it this far in the past few years. What's one more month? It matters. It really does. The doctor said I don't have many days left. It could be any day now. I desperately need that month. Vanessa's face turned even darker. Noah. Are you really that eager to leave me? I didn't want to see her anymore. Not even for a second. My days are so few now. And I want to keep these last ones for myself. I got up to leave. But she blocked me. Saying. The property will be split in half. And the lawyer needs time to handle that. If you rush, you'll lose a lot. There's no need to be so hasty. Take it all. It's all yours. I paused for a moment and continued. Vanessa. Let's not see each other again. I hope you get what you want. Noah. Can you stop being so childish? She shouted angrily as I walked away. I ignored her and bought a plane ticket to Dolly. I have a house there that I bought a year ago. It has a small yard with a large jacaranda tree. And I heard that in May or June. It will bloom with many flowers. At the time. I had just received a large commission for a project, and I fell in love with the yard at first sight. Since it was in a remote area, it was cheap. Thankfully, I never told anyone about it, so now I have somewhere to go. A few nights after arriving at the house, the pain became unbearable, 
and I couldn't sleep. I got up, gave myself a painkiller injection, and then my mom called. She immediately started yelling, Are you crazy? Divorcing someone as good as Vanessa? To make room for your Oscar, right? Noah, what are you talking about? She shouted angrily, Nothing. I'll hang up now, I said calmly. Aren't you going to take care of me anymore? Are you just going to live your life without even caring about your own parents? She started crying. How much do you want? Do you really think I'm that annoying? I carried you in my belly. She kept repeating. As if this was some kind of curse. As if I were a puppet under her spell. Whenever she said these words or anything similar. I was supposed to obey her. If you don't tell me. I'll hang up. I said impatiently. 300,000. Give me 300,000. Oscar needs medical treatment. And we need to rent a place. She cautiously said. I'll give you 500,000. I had about 600,000 left. Enough for me to get by for the rest of my days. That amount should be enough to support her in her old age. But if she kept supporting Oscar, there wasn't much I could do. Why are you being so generous? I muttered to myself. Mom, do I still owe you something? What are you saying? Haven't I paid you back yet? How much more do you want? What else do you want me to do? Noah, Noah. She called out, sounding uneasy. I'll give you 500,000. But you won't be my mother anymore. Okay. I won't be your son anymore. Okay. I didn't choose this, and there's nothing I can do about it. I'll give you the money. Okay. But from now on, you can't be my mother anymore. After saying that, I hung up the phone. I kept telling myself that it was okay. It would all be over soon. Everything would be over soon. All I have left are these few days for myself, and they are all I have left. There was a small stove in the room, but even with the air conditioning on, I still felt unbearably cold. Wrapping the blanket tightly around myself, the winter sun shone through the curtains that I hadn't fully drawn casting a bright light on my face, and I realized that it had been daylight for a long time. I propped myself up slightly to open the curtains. The rolling mountains and misty clouds stretched before me, creating a breathtakingly beautiful scene. With such a view, I should be savoring each day I have left, but I regret all the time I've wasted. Before I could take in much more of the view, my phone rang again. I was so irritated that I wanted to smash it, but my best friend Diego was supposed to visit me in a few days, and I wanted to see him. If I smashed the phone, he wouldn't be able to reach me. I need to see him one last time. I picked up the phone, and it was my dad calling. Son, your mom's gone crazy. Don't pay attention to her. Keep your money for yourself. Son, are you okay? I'm sorry. It's all my fault. It's okay if you're divorcing. Where are you now? For someone who rarely speaks. He said so much all at once, but I didn't feel anything. He is my father. My biological father. All these years, he's been working hard to support the family. But he's also always watched my situation from the sidelines, telling me I should understand them. Understand why my mom did the things she did. They named me Noah. To know other people's feelings. To be kind. To be empathetic. To be obedient. To be good. But they never taught me how to know my own feelings. Every day, I didn't know why I was alive. It was all for one goal after another. To study hard. To give way to Oscar. To save money for the family. To earn money for the family. Dad. Yes. I'm listening. Son. I don't owe you anything anymore, do I? Ah, son, son, he kept shouting, I'm asking, I don't owe you anything anymore, do I? I repeated, son, I'm sorry, it's all my fault, it's all my fault. Dad, can you do me a favor? I thought for a moment and pleaded, tell me, whatever you need, I'll do it, I don't want to be your son anymore, okay. He didn't say anything, and I only heard the sound of his stifled sobs, I continued. Being your child is too exhausting. I'm so tired. Can we stop this? Don't contact me anymore. Okay. Don't look for me anymore either. We don't owe each other anything anymore. After a long silence, he finally said, No one will make things hard for you anymore. Never again. I hung up the phone, and my tears soaked my face. I had always been taught that men don't cry. But now, in my final days, I found myself shedding so many tears. Soon after, it was followed by violent coughing and vomiting. When the pain became too much, I finally drifted off to sleep. Chapter 8 When I woke up, Diego was by my side, and his eyes were red. I pretended not to care and said, Why are you crying? Your brother's just going ahead to scout the way for you. When you reach a hundred years old and come down, I'll have your back. Before I could finish, he swung his fist at my chest, but stopped midair, clearly thinking better of it. Noah, how much stupider can you be? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you say anything earlier? I kept pretending like it was no big deal. Haven't I told you now? He didn't respond, wiping his tears as he prepared my liquid food. He had come fully prepared, like he knew what to do, even more professionally than I did. How long have you been on this diet? I looked down, avoiding his gaze. Don't worry about that. I don't keep track of the days. A large tear fell onto my blanket, 
Pretending not to notice, I asked. How many days of leave do you have this time? The scenery here is great. I'll take you around. I quit my job. He said calmly. Are you crazy? Why would you quit? You work so hard for this. For what? Have you lost your mind? You. He didn't respond to anything I said. Just quietly tidying up the dishes. Noah. My life isn't going to be affected by a few days off. With my skills. I can go back anytime. He said. Still with his back to me. Trying to sound upbeat. In that moment. I suddenly felt like my life wasn't as bad as I thought. Chapter 9. After signing the divorce papers. I blocked Vanessa on every platform. Diego picked up the divorce certificate for me. He told me that Vanessa kept asking about me. Wanting to know what was going on. But Diego ignored her. When he told me this. I didn't have much of a reaction. I just said. I don't want to hear any more news about her. I never want to see her again. Got it. I'll make sure she never sees you. He said. Thumping his chest with determination. My illness was getting worse. And I was often in unbearable pain. Unable to sleep at night. One night. When the pain kept me awake again. Diego burst in with a painkiller injection. Is it hurting that much? You need to call me. Call me. Noah. I was in so much pain at one point that I started looking up euthanasia online. Only to find out that even dying was too expensive for me. In Switzerland. Euthanasia costs around 700,000 yuan. Thinking about that. I gave up. One night. I got a call from an unknown number. The moment I heard the voice. I knew it was Vanessa. So I hung up immediately. She texted me. Saying. I need to be there in person for the property division. I wanted to tell her to leave me alone. But then I remembered my thoughts on euthanasia. And despite my hands shaking from the pain. I tried to type. Just give me 700,000. The rest is yours. Noah. Where are you? I want to see you. I'm sorry. Can we just meet once? Forget it. I'll handle this myself. I blocked that number too. I lay in bed. Sweat soaking through my clothes. I lay there. Wide awake. Feeling every bit of the pain. Then. I noticed the sky starting to brighten. And suddenly I felt a small surge of energy. I changed clothes. I took a blanket and lay down on the rocking chair under the jacaranda tree as the sun slowly rose. Ushering in a new day. Diego got up and brought me a glass of water. I could barely make out his face. Struggling to keep my eyes open. He slowly walked over. And when I could see him clearly. He asked me what I was looking at. Diego. The jacaranda tree doesn't bloom until May or June. When it blooms. It's covered in blue flowers. It should be beautiful. Yeah. I really want to see it. Neither of us said anything after that. I reached out and grabbed his hand. I didn't die inside the house. I'm sorry I didn't leave you anything except this house. His eyes filled with tears. And he shook his head repeatedly. When the sun comes out. This house is pretty warm. I slowly lost consciousness. Noah. Noah. When people die. They don't need to worry about the things from when they were alive. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. You belong to yourself now. You're free. I could hear his sobbing voice. My friend. Don't cry anymore. We'll meet again someday. Extra chapter. When I woke up again. My pillow was soaked with tears. It was just a dream after all. I'm not Noah. There's no Vanessa. And no Oscar. Only Noah's cousin Lisa. Who took over everything like a cuckoo bird. In my dream. I was Noah. But in reality. I'm the heartless man. Experiencing my wife's life in a dream. Two completely reversed scenarios. The life of a girl who had been mistreated since childhood. Never shown any affection or love. She had once cried to me about her family, and I had calmly comforted her, but in truth, it hadn't moved me much. I grew up surrounded by love, so how could I ever understand the depth of her pain? It turns out there truly are things in this world that are so painful, they make you wish you could die. I finally understood why, in her final moments, she didn't want to see me. Lisa sent another WeChat message, we who are still alive must look forward. I made chicken soup for you, I'm downstairs. I climbed to the rooftop, and when I saw her, she had no guilt. Not even a trace. Her face was full of hope for the future. I envied her heartlessness and cold-blooded nature. But why? Why is the world so unfair? I couldn't continue living. I couldn't bear waking up every day with this overwhelming guilt toward Noah. In a daze, I seemed to see the jacaranda flowers that Noah loved, quietly blooming. I wanted so badly to pick one and give it to her, hoping that maybe, just maybe, she would see me one last time because of it. I stepped forward, but I didn't manage to pick a jacaranda flower. Nor did I see Noah. All I could hear was Lisa's sharp scream. The concrete was hard, and I must have looked terrible. But that's fine. Noah didn't want to see me, so it didn't matter how I looked. Noah, I won't come looking for you anymore. In the next life, don't be called Noah. I'll block the way on the road to the afterlife, and no one will be able to disturb you again.